Hello and welcome to The Print. I am Radifa Kabir and today we have with us Dr. Prabhu Rajagopal, who won a Vigyan Yuva in Technology and Innovation this year. Hello, Dr. Rajagopal. Welcome to The Print. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Radifa. Sir, congratulations on winning the prestigious Vigyan Yuva Award. Thank you. Before we begin the interview, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Rajagopal. Dr. Rajagopal is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Madras. Also, his areas of research include robots equipped with sensors which can be sent to remote areas such as oceans, underground tunnels, and radioactive regions in order to detect defects in infrastructure and equipment. Now, these robots reach areas which are inaccessible to humans. Isn't this interesting? Now we would like to begin the interview. Sir, can you please tell us about the nature of your work and the research which won you the Vigyan Yuva Award? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, also the print for having me over. So um, my work involves uh, development of non-destructive evaluation techniques. These essentially are techniques that can use to be uh, understand the nature of materials and their performance without having to destructively test them. And uh, also over the years, I have worked on ways of sending these sensors to remote locations, as you said, either deep underwater or at high temperatures or under high pressure and so on. And for this purpose, I've been working on a very specific niche of robotics called inspection robotics. Now, I'm also very interested in technology translation. So I'm very passionate about startups. And uh, that's part of my journey, uh, which is recognized by this award, which is in the field of technology and innovation. So I've co-founded uh, several startups that license my IPs and help take my solutions to the field uh, to date. And finally, uh, I have also been the faculty in charge for our uh, student-led makerspace, the Center for Innovation, and also the pre-incubator Nirman as the advisor for innovation and entrepreneurship. And this is very important uh, part of my journey as well in terms of science administration and trying to take my learnings and seed them so that we have a younger generation uh, taking up the same path for innovation and entrepreneurship to benefit the society. Yes, sir. Can you please elaborate non-destructive evaluation? So uh, all of us are familiar with uh, x-rays for example right so if you have a uh, fracture in a leg or if you want to examine your tooth you go to the uh, hospital and get yourself x-ray and what this does is that whatever you can't see with your normal sight you the x-ray gives you a vision that is deeper inside so this is non-destructive evaluation in action the x-ray is the oldest nde uh, technique that is known to mankind but in the last uh, you know several decades several newer techniques have come up so for example ultrasonics uh, also eddy currents thermal techniques so these are all different ways of looking inside materials without harming them without causing any uh, material damage to them and then understand their structural performance and characteristics so that is nde for you yes so how does ultrasonic technology work in remote inspection so ultrasonics uh, as a modality is actually just sound. All of us are familiar with sound. You know, the way uh, you would have played with, uh, you know, tin can phones when you were younger, right? You have two tin cans and then you talk on one end, sound travels to the other end and reaches the other person. So this is ex the exact principle that we use to uh, do remote monitoring using ultrasonics. We send very high frequency sound, sound that is beyond the human hearing through these uh, little um, conduits, what we call as waveguides. And then on the other end, there is a process that we want to monitor, such as something that is happening at high temperatures or something that is happening at radiative conditions or high pressures. So whatever uh, does not permit entry of human beings is happening on one end. And the waveguide travels to that point, carrying sound. Now, speed of sound is dependent upon material properties. Uh, it is dependent, which are ultimately dependent upon the environmental conditions, the density, the Young's modulus and so on, depend upon the temperature, pressure and so on. So by measuring the speed of sound, you can measure 
these material conditions and that's how remote sensing using ultrasonic works yes and dr rajagopal i had read about your research in which you mentioned ultrasonic metamaterials and you also wrote that they help in shielding structures from environmental and seismic damages can you please elaborate on that thank you uh, this is my favorite subject in fact today the focus area of my research is a lot on ultrasonic and acoustic metamaterials so metamaterials are uh, structures whose properties come from the arrangement of very specific features classically whenever we understood materials whenever we want to develop something for a new application we think of a new material a new alloy a new ore and so on now over the last 30 years scientists have understood that material properties can also be managed with the help of the structure itself so if you have say a series of channels a series of holes a series of inclusions in a parent material this one this kind of material has a aggregate behavior which can be tailored so for example you can classically you can see uh, only a certain dimension with a given modality for example with normal eyesight we will not be able to see two dots which are very close to each other now if you bring in a magnifying glass you will start to see that if something is even smaller than that you need a microscope to see look into it so this is called the resolution limit classically the only way to improve the resolution limit is to go to a different and different modality or by using a lens for example what a meta material allows us is to achieve a lens in different different modalities using ultrasonics for example a meta material lens will help us to look beyond what is classically possible using uh, the normal frequencies that we employ now the same lens you know that can not just give you a you know very good uh, resolution it can also actually um, destroy the uh, thing so for example if we use a lens to burn a paper for example the rays are getting concentrated at one point so manipulation of uh, you know waves is possible using lenses so this is what we try to do in a, in a, using ultrasonic meta materials we tend to get the sound go around a certain object by manipulating the structure of the material itself and this is how we achieve shielding for uh, you know seismic or environmental disturbances so we are very excited now that we you know we can use meta materials to damp environmental noise so for example if you want a room which you want to make it anechoic we are working on coatings by which you know no sound can pass inside or outside from the room now even now there are you know coatings available but they do not work at very low frequencies so for example that is why even in a uh, you know very well sheeted chamber if somebody is hammering away outside or somebody is drilling away outside you will still hear that noise because that is very low frequency ultrasonic and acoustic meta materials help us to damp even those low frequency vibrations and uh, you know sound ultrasound vibration are just different ends of the same phenomenon different frequencies so what works for vibration what works for sound also works for you know earthquake disturbances because the you know elastic waves that travel in the mantle of the earth uh, are also you know those are the seismic disturbances and we are working on you know scaled up seismic meta materials by which we can shield uh, sensitive areas sensitive structures from very low frequency disturbances yes can you please explain the science behind how ultrasonic waves and sound waves they protect these structures in simple language yeah so imagine there is a structure that is at the risk of uh, you know incoming seismic wave so the uh, an earthquake travels as a disturbance through the earth right that's called the seismic wave so classically we understand that there is a fast wave that's called the primary and then there is a slower wave which is called the secondary wave but these are ultimately disturbances that are traveling through the medium of the earth itself what we are trying to do is that when the wave travels to the structure we alter it the path you know alter uh, the the you know the way the wave travels such that it will instead of reaching the structure it will go around or it will go down and then it gets damped in that process so this is how the acoustic meta materials and seismic meta materials work i hope oh, that explains really interesting 
Yes, sir, it did. And another question which comes to our mind is that these robots are sent to remote areas with adverse conditions. For instance, radioactive regions, they have adverse conditions. Even oceans have adverse conditions. So what materials are these robots and sensors made of so that not only are they not damaged, but they also remain functional? Thank you. So the beauty of uh, our work is that you know, as design engineers, we make uh, structures that can last for a certain number of cycles and operations. So let us say you want to go deep ocean or deep underwater. We design the body of the robot such that they can go up to 100, 200, 300 meters. This is called the design depth in a way that they perform safely for several you know, thousands of cycles. So right now, typically we tend to use aluminum or steel or fiber plastic for the body of the robot, depending upon the application and also the cost. Steel is the costliest, followed by aluminum, followed by plastic. So if you want to go, you know, just a little deeper from the surface, you typically use fiber plastic, a little bit more deeper aluminum, deep underwater, it tends to be steel, typically. Our research in, is in trying to design the structure to be safe under these kinds of conditions. How do we encase the sensors inside and still be able to perform the kinds of operations that we want them to perform? That is our research. And we've done a lot of work on these kinds of modular designs, philosophy-led designs, and so on for these applications. Yes, sir. Have any of these robots been commercialized? Thank you. Uh, that's close to my heart indeed. Uh, in our lab, in my lab, we are very passionate about taking our innovations to the field. Several of these solutions have been commercialized, primarily through startups that have come out of our own lab. So uh, Planis Technologies is one of, is the earliest startup I've been associated with, formed by Tanuj Junjunwala, who was one of my dual degree students from 2012, 2013. And Planis has been commercializing these robots for inspection of bridges, dams, uh, road crossings of rail and road bridges, and also storage tanks in the oil and gas industry. Uh, these robots, Beluga, My, you know, Mike, Micros, and so on, have been employed all over the country. They have inspected several river crossings of road bridges, almost 100 bridges in Maharashtra, you know, several dozens in uh, Tamil Nadu, in Gujarat, in all across the country. And interestingly, this startup also has a footprint uh, in the Netherlands, a wholly owned sub owned subsidiary, subsidiary in the Netherlands. So we also done work in Europe and also done work in the Middle East. So uh, last year, for example, we inspected, you know, about 40 to 50 water tanks in one of the major refineries of the country. So that is with respect to the, uh, you know, open water and confined space inspection. The other very socially relevant application for which, you know, uh, you know that inspires me a lot is the application of our robots for um, mechanized cleaning of septic tanks. One of my other startups called Solinas integrity commercializes this solution and uh, the robot called homostep that has been developed to eliminate manual scavenging has been deployed at over 30 locations across the country today uh, trying to help the safai karamcharis find a way to perform their uh, work with dignity um, and indeed the high temperature sensors have also found practical industrial application through our startup called zyma that is today employed across mining, mineral ore, processing, and oil and gas industries, both oh, India and Interesting. And are there any biomedical applications of these robots? Thank you. Uh, biomedical applications is something that we have been working on. In fact, uh, Solinas won the National Bio Entrepreneurship Award way back in uh, 2019. Um, so there is a there's two ways of looking at this. One, indeed, the robots themselves. So, for example, in sewer lines or in septic tanks, we've been using robots for gaining inside views. And during a pandemic, particularly, this becomes very relevant. We may get early insight into something by looking at the pathogens inside these kinds of environments. So that is one kind of application that has been going on. The other major application for my work recently in the biomedical domain is uh, the use of distributed ledger technologies. So I started looking at data integrity because a lot of our robots and sensors generated data remotely and we need to be able to uh, protect their integrity through the entire process generation uh, transmission storage and retrieval 
right? And that's how we started looking at blockchain, Web3, and DLTs for these applications. Today, there is a major use for all of this in the healthcare industry, where we are trying to develop a universal health ID based on blockchain that will bring about interoperability for patients and process of efficiency for hospitals. This is commercialized through one of my recent startups called Plenome. Yes, sir. And would you like to add something else about your research and these robots? Thank you. Um, you know, it's it's a great joy for me that uh, this award recognizes this kind of practical work. Indeed, my work uh, has fundamental dimensions. I've studied sound at the quantum scale for which I was awarded the Swarnajanti Fellowship a few years ago. Now that is taking metamaterials down to the extreme. So completely, you know, undersizing them, trying to achieve nanoscale resolution and so on. But on the other hand, as a scientist, as an engineer, as a technologist, I remain interested in practical problems, whether it is trying to monitor a high temperature process in an industrial context or trying to uh, look at ways of cleaning septic tanks uh, in a social context or trying to maintain an industrial asset such as a storage tank and so on. Now, the Bhatnagar Award that is in this technology and innovation category recognizes this kind of you know, practical work, which is very exciting for young scientists and technologists all over the country. And I'm very grateful that science, science administrators have uh, appreciated this kind of work that is that spans the spectrum of fundamental to applied, what I call as a TRL spectrum from three to nine. So I'm very glad to uh, see that. Can you please tell us about the TRL spectrum from three to nine? So uh, technology readiness levels are the industry standard ways of measuring the maturity of any given solution or a product. And typically, you know, when you have a proof of concept, that is technology readiness level or TRL three. And this is where most of the scientific research classically stops because you've developed a proof, you know, you've published a paper, you've uh, filed an IP and so on. But beyond that, three to six is a series of mock-up tests. So you try to simulate practical conditions and try to employ your solution, try to show that it works or learn what is not working. And then seven to nine is field deployment, right? So that's the TRL spectrum that we talk about, both proof of concept as well as field deployability. This is what is, uh, you know, the, is the spectrum that I am very passionate about. Yes, sir. And how far has your research reached from the lab to common people so indeed some of the work is you know completely uh, field uh, delivered and commercialized so the robots i was talking to you about for inspection of river crossings of road and road and rail bridges for inspection of water tanks storage tanks for inspection of uh, uh, you know have reached industrial uh, clients all across india and the world in the middle east and netherlands Today, the robots from our lab, so the Endobot series of robots commercialized by Solinas, are uh, inspecting and maintaining water and sewer lines uh, in smart cities across half a dozen cities in India. On the other hand, there is some research, for example, collaborative robots for human assistive tasks or AI in robotics and so on are still research aspects that, uh, you know, that continue to excite me uh, on an everyday basis. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the lovely interview. It was really insightful. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ms. Radifa. I hope I look forward to this broadcast. Thank you. Thank you.